Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar of Food Systems and Animal Rights Working Group of the Federation of Young European Greens. We are here today to talk about the common agricultural policy of the EU, how it is changing our lives today, what it's good for, and in what cases uh, it actually hurts us and the European project, and how we can actually reform it right now. So here today are two speakers. The first is Clara Baer. She is French and German origin, and she is very passionate about agriculture. She studied European affairs at the College of Europe in Burgess and specialized on the common agricultural policy and environmental issues. She is currently working for an NGO called Going Organic that aims to promote organic farming in Europe. Our second guest is Antoine Tiffin. He is the member of the executive committee of the Federation of Young European Greens and is working as an intern in the European Parliament on the reform of the common agricultural policy. He has a master's in European policies and public affairs from the Strasbourg Institute of Political Science. So would you like to, would you like to say hi to our audience, dear speakers? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Thanks for the introduction. OK, so we will start with the main portion of the webinar in approximately five minutes. As I said, we will cover the current situation of the CAP, Common Agricultural Policy, and its attempts at a reform from a green perspective. Uh, but before we start, I would like to ask our dear guest speakers some short questions um for example first how did you start working in the fields of eu policy and agriculture and when when did you realize you were interested in these two separate fields and how did you come to merge them into one interest uh i will start with asking clara um so thank you very much for being here and hello again to everyone uh, yes, so as French and German, for me, it was quite uh, natural, I would say, to go into European affairs. I'm a really convinced European, and uh, so that choice was not a very difficult choice, I would say. Um, I'm really interested in agriculture, and it's actually something I'm interested in a long, since a long time ago, because I think, I, I really truly think that what we eat and the way we treat our earth, our grounds, our soils, is essential and is one of the most important things. It's all linked to our own health and the health of our planet. So I guess that that for me is the main part of the agricultural policy. I will pass on to Antoine now. Yeah. Um, so personally, me, it's through FYG that I've got interested in European politics. Uh, I've joined the French Young Greens uh, seven years ago and took part to my first FRG event six years ago. And uh, and through that, after that, I decided to study European politics. And after my uh, my master's degree, uh, I, my, I've done my graduation internship for a farmer union, which is uh, La Via Campesina. It's a farmer movement um, international, at the international level. Uh, and, uh, and then I've kept on working on, on, this, on this issue. So yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, it's good. We can start with the actual content. OK, great. So uh, I would continue and ask Clara, uh, what do you think is the current main um, positives of the common agricultural policy? And what do you think is actually good about the way that we have synchronized our agriculture policies on the European level to uh, benefit the populace of the EU? Um, this is a very difficult question. <laughs> And I'm actually going to address that in my presentation. So um, uh, I think that one of the major benefits, if I have to just quote one or select one, is that the common agriculture has uh, ensured food security uh, for Europe. 
So we all have access to food and to energy food at an affordable price. So I think that would be one of the major positive aspects. But as I said, I will, I will go deeper into that during my presentation. Martin, don't forget to unmute when you want to speak. I think you, we didn't hear you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so you can go ahead and show us your presentation on the CAP. We are excited to see it. And Antoine, don't hesitate to add something uh, in the progress of the presentation. And I would also like to remind our audience to write questions for our speakers in the chat in the YouTube uh, window. Exactly. Okay, so I will start uh, to speak about the common agricultural policy. Um, so I prepared a little presentation, so just to provide uh, more clarity. Um, I will start uh, by reminding us why we actually have a common agricultural policy uh, and when it was created. Um, because I think that's um, really uh, important. So the Common Agricultural Policy was created in 1957 uh, by the Treaty of Rome and it was introduced in 1962. And it was created to answer or to respond to five main objectives. And to understand these objectives that are still the objective of uh, Common Agricultural Policy now, um, we have to go a bit back in the context of uh, the European Union at that moment, we are still uh, after the Second World War and uh, you, you, the European Union is still emerging and decided to put uh, agriculture uh, together and um, the issue of food security was very important at that moment uh, since we are, as I, as I said before, in an after-war context where everything has to be rebuilt and uh, constructed again. So these objectives uh, of the common agricultural policy are still uh, the objective of our current uh, agricultural system. And there are five of them. So the first one is to increase agricultural productivity. As I said, uh, this first objective has been set because uh, agricultural productivity at that time was very low and it really needed to be pushed forward. So that's why it's, it's, it's there. The second part is um, that to ensure a fair standard of living for the agricultural com community. So to make sure that farmers have a decent uh, uh, conditions of life uh, and work. Then uh, the third one is to stabilize the markets. Uh, so to ensure that uh, prices for food are, uh, are correct and are not too expensive or, 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 or not. Um, then to, I, I think the fourth and the fifth one are actually together because uh, it's to assure that we have enough food and that this food is um, not too expensive for the European con consumer. So, um, so that was, th that are the five main objectives of uh, the common agricultural policy. And um, um, I think that is really important to understand uh, the policy that we have now. So I will go now a bit into the history of um, the common agricultural policy. Uh, just to give you a brief understanding of how we got into the system that we have now. And um, uh, so we have a, a, a first part, which goes from 1962 to 1992, um, and is what I, what I entitled Guaranteed Price. So uh, why is it entitled like that is because um, so at the beginning of the cap, the, the main goal was, as I said, to increase productivity and to ensure food supply for everyone. So to make sure and to incentivize farmers to produce more and to modernize the production, 
the European Commission uh, decided to ensure a minimum guaranteed price for the farmers. So this means that, um, just to give a, a short example, uh, if you are, for example, producing uh, cucumbers, and uh, so you will sell your cucumbers on the market, and you would normally sell them for one euro. But let's imagine that because of a draft period or other issues, um, the price on the market is not one euro anymore, but is 80 cents. So that is a problem for a farmer because he's, he has a, a diminution in his price. And so in that case, the EU would at that time um, buy the production at the guaranteed price of one euro. So even if the market price is lower, the farmer would still sell his cucumber, cucumber at one euro. So. And uh, this was really to ensure that uh, the farmers would keep producing even if the price was not as good as it, as it always should be. So we had this system of uh, minimum guaranteed price. The issue was, I mean, it worked quite well because uh, agricultural productivity uh, really became more and more important and uh, the sector was growing, growing quite fast. The issue is, was that actually it was going too well. Um, farmers were producing too much and rapidly the supply exceeded the demand. So uh, the EU was confronted with what we call now the fountains of food. So you can imagine fountains and fountains of food uh, that were stored until the prices went up by the European Union. It was very expensive. And uh, we had just surpluses and we didn't know what to do with them. So um, uh, in order to, uh, to change that, um, the EU decided to reform the common agricultural policy in 1992. And that is a key reform, uh, actually, a really, important, um, a really important point that I entitled the turning point because it was the moment where the cap was not uh, moved from a system of guaranteed prices to an income, income support system. So instead of having guaranteed prices for the productions, Farmers now receive what we call now direct payments, so an income support, um, in order to compensate the losses uh, of their production if the price on the market was too, too low. So instead of, ge of getting a guaranteed price, they would just get subsidies from the European Union um, to compensate uh, their loss in payments uh, if prices were too low. So these direct payments were um, attributed according to the size of the farm. So what we call now the payment per hectare. Uh, so if you get, if you have 100 hectares, you get, let's say, uh, I actually, I don't remember the exact amounts, but you get a certain amount. And if you have less, you get less uh, money. But there were also, um, um, given according to the level of production. So the level of production was calculated every year and according to that you would receive a certain amount of direct payment. Um, so this system of uh, income support uh, enabled the EU to have a reduction of the surpluses. So it uh, enabled uh, to resolve the problem that was created by the current system and uh, it changed also the situation for the farmers who were, who are now getting uh, direct payments from the European Union. Uh, and so the reforms that uh, were decided after uh, this turning point, so in 1999, 2003 and 2008, only, uh, I mean, they mainly deepened uh, that system. So they mainly, they really uh, engaged into that uh, uh, direct payment system. So um, I will only uh, tell you about the main points of these uh, three reforms. I will not go too much into details because, I mean, we could uh, talk about that for hours. 
Um, but so what the 1993 reform introduced, and uh, we still have today, is the so-called two-pillar system. So the cap is now divided into two pillars. Uh, so the pillar one concerns these direct payments that I mentioned uh, before, and uh, also the common market organization. So I will go uh, back to that later. And the pillar two concerns the rural development, um, so such as uh, uh, natural resources, uh, climate action, uh, knowledge transfer, uh, territorial development, etc. So the main difference between those two pillars is that two, the first pillar is entirely subsidized by the European Union. So the money that is spent uh, in the pillar one for the direct payments uh, comes directly from the European Union. Um, whereas for the pillar two, there, are members, there is some budget from the European Union, but also the member states um, uh, also have uh, their share, and so it's uh, co-founded by the member states. So that is the main uh, difference. Of course, pillar one is much more important. It's approximately 70% of the common agricultural policy and of the common agricultural policy's budget, whereas pillar two is only 30% of the budget. And um, so it's less important uh, in, in numbers or uh, its figures than pillar one. Um, Another important uh, point is that the 2003 and 2008 reforms, um, so they kept that system of direct payments, but now farmers only get direct payments per hectare. So the system that was going on before uh, with direct payments linked, I mean, linked to hectares and to the production, uh, is not ongoing anymore, and direct payments are only calculated per hectare. There are some exceptions, uh, which I will come back to later, but basically that's the main point. We have now a common agricultural policy with two pillars, and uh, the pillar one concerns the direct payments, and these direct payments are calculated by hectare. Um, so, of course, uh, the big farms, uh, receive more money than the small farms, uh, since uh, it's calculated per hectare. Uh, after these uh, reforms, we had the 2013 reform, which um, brings some, I mean, which brought some new, uh, some new parts to the common agricultural policy, but still didn't change the system of direct payments per hectare. Uh, what it added uh, and is uh, actually important is the introduction of the green payment, so what we call the greening of the CAP. Um, because, uh, of course, uh, environmental issues uh, are becoming more and more important, and um, um, agriculture is actually uh, a part uh, or plays a role in uh, CO2 emissions. But agriculture has a very important role because um, through agriculture, you can reach climate mitigation or adaptation. So meaning, actually, with agriculture, you can reduce the environmental impact. Uh, so uh, the um, European Commission decided at that time to enforce that environmental part in uh, the common agricultural policy and introduce uh, this green payment. So this green payment is there to re reward uh, farmers for climate and environmental friendly farming practices. And uh, actually 30% of uh, the direct payments are dedicated to the green payment. So it's an important part of the uh, budget and of, um, and of uh, the direct payments uh, of all. Uh, I will also uh, speak a bit more in detail about what is actually, the, or what are actually the greening measures, but it's just to understand that um, we have now with this direct uh, payment system, and in addition to that, we have also uh, a green payment. 
that has been introduced since 2014. And this reform will uh, be ongoing until uh, 2020. And we'll have a new reform that is currently being discussed uh, by the three institutions. Um, and that will be, uh, that will start or be in place from 2020 onwards. Uh, Antoine will, will speak a bit more, uh, a bit more about that later. Um, so, um, that was just a brief, uh, uh, historical introduction to the CAP. Um, I really emphasized on the main objectives of the CAP, um, why it was created and, uh, what, what it was created for. And, um, and also try to make you understand that we moved from, uh, from a guaranteed price system to a direct income support. And um, that these, uh, this direct income support is, um, it, it's really important to understand that because it explains a lot why um, we have um, the issues that we have now with the common agriculture policy. So um, I will that I will end now with uh, with if, that part. Um, maybe if you have some questions. Uh, yeah. There are no questions in the chat yet, but Antoine would like to add something to the first part. Oh, and Eloise wants to have a question. So first, Antoine, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Clara, for 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 the introduction. Maybe uh, I'd like to maybe say different perspective on on some of the things that you, that you that you said. Because first, I think that one of the questions that we we should wonder is like, like sometimes people wonder is why did we do a, a, an agricultural policy at the beginning? Why why was it decided? And actually, we can better understand it if we if we understand that at the beginning. The agricultural policy was mostly a custom policy. So it was about what goes inside the European community and what goes outside of the European community. And as the beginning of the... Um, uh, someone asked Eloise to mute. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me well? Can you all hear me well? Okay. Um, so... So yeah, and so first, the, the guaranteed price were mostly guaranteed by the fact that the, the, the European community would not let imports enter the European market under a certain price, and they would like put quite substantial taxes to prevent imports from floating the markets and uh, at, a, at a cheap price. And, uh, and this was the way they, they developed it, and also by subsidizing exports uh when 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 these were up, happening so at the beginning the guaranteed price were mostly a custom policy uh and that's why it makes sense because at the beginning of the european union it was mostly a custom union um and but and 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 then that's because of wto so the world trade organization and, and their rules that we had to shift from another model uh i know maybe first before that was the, the the problem of the of the overproduction that brought to the introduction of quotas to try to to reduce the production because it it, it started to cost a lot of money and then it was the WTO that forced uh, that forced us to get rid of this old system with the uh, custom policy and to go to uh, to direct support. Uh, and and with this new system, what we've seen since we don't have any regulation of prices, it's a drop of prices. And uh, and this this is something that um, might be key to keep in mind when we will talk about what are the green demands. What I will do later. But sorry, I will I will. Uh, uh, I will. Uh, I will let. Uh, I think Eloise, you had the question. You said, oh, but she dropped out. So, but she's back. Hey, Eloise, you can ask our speakers your question. Uh, yes, I'm so sorry. Um, yes, my question was about. Um, uh, productivity because uh, and efficiency because uh, one of the main objective uh, about the implementation of the pack was 
uh, to be uh, more efficient and increase productivity. But um, why the productivity was very low uh, after uh, World War II? Uh, because I, I think that uh, we uh, didn't use a fertilizer and all that stuff. And why uh, now we think that um, as a sector without uh, pesticide and fertilizer um, um, get more productivity than uh, the others. So why why uh, there was this problem before, and why uh, we want to um, go back to? I don't know if I explain me, but uh, you know this idea. <laughs> Clara, do you want to answer or? or um, I'm actually really sorry, but I didn't understand you quite well because the sound was uh, not loud enough. Um, so I will I will pass to Antoine. Um, okay. I think he, he understood you well and he will uh, surely be able to answer you. Um, yeah. and, I, I, just, I just wanted to make a, a quick point about uh, your comment, Antoine, on, uh, on this uh, brief uh, introduction to the CIP. And uh, uh, I, you're absolutely right in uh, in saying um, that issue about uh, about all the international aspect of a, of a common agricultural policy that is very important. Um, I just I, I chose to keep it simple and short, so I didn't mention it uh, because I thought it would go into too much. Uh, uh, it would take too much time, but uh, it's a, of course very important, and we can surely speak about that uh, later again. And yeah, and I managed. Yeah, uh, I I just added because I think because it could relate to what I will add, what I will say later. That's why I, I added it. Uh, and so Eloise was asking uh, for those who might, didn't manage to hear her. And so maybe next time, Eloise, bring breathe your microphone closer to your mouth. Um, the um, she was asking why we had a low uh, productivity uh, before the cap and why uh, and so and basically she was trying to bring to bring the answer is it because we didn't have like pesticides and everything and so is our goal as green uh, to come back to the previous model but then do we feel it will be won't it create like food insecurity or or stuff like that? Uh, and indeed, that that's that that's um, that's that's a that's a good question. Um, but you have like two parts of of it, and actually the the, the pesticide or the fertilizer part is only one part of of, of the the reason why we had uh, like food insecurity in in Europe and and, uh, and a low productivity. The the first thing that was missing was uh, mechanization and the fact that you didn't have uh, tractors and they were not uh, and 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 also the the fact that the the markets were organized at a really local level so you, the, you, there were also some food that was uh, that was uh, wasted uh, because because of that and so part of the like because the farmers managed to get uh, higher incomes they've been able to buy this uh, this uh, these uh, tractors and uh, and and they've there have also been infrastructure that have been built to store food, to distribute it. So this this is the part that for the, the greens would not wouldn't want to to come back. But maybe at at a certain point, it it went a bit too far in in the in the in the producing always more and always more. And there is one part that is that is that is important, and that's probably linked to also with the what we can call the international aspect of of, of cap. There are some productions, for example, on meat. On which we are overproducing. We are producing more than what the Europe, what the European Union needs uh, to to be able to 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 live correctly. And what are we doing with this overproduction? We are just shipping it to other country, and it's really cheap because our agriculture is really subsidized. And we are not helping developing countries to develop their own agricultural system. So actually, by just maybe come, maybe indeed we would produce a bit, a bit less, but on some key, uh, key uh, productions. Uh, but 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 this would only mean that we would stop exporting and maybe focus on what we what we need to produce for ourselves. But now also, like. Innovation is not only about pesticides and mechanization and fertilizer. Like there have also been innovation in organic agriculture and in agroecology. 
So now we can produce more than what we used to produce without pesticides uh, in the like today without pesticides. So in organic agriculture, we produce more than what we would produce without pesticide uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. I hope it answered your question. Great. Do you, if you want to add something, uh, Clara, or I don't know if there were other questions. Um, yes, I, I would just, I, I think you answered uh, very, uh, very well. I, I would just like to add that one thing to explain this increase in productivity is simply the fact that we have a common agricultural policy. Before that, uh, we had some, of course, some national policy on agriculture, but not at all at the same level than what we have now. And that is uh, a, that makes a huge difference because uh, if you have subsidies for farmers or a system of guaranteed prices or anyhow, if you have a policy and, and money uh, to encourage and incentivize farmers to produce more, uh, of course, that, that, that encourages farmers to, to do so. Uh, if you don't, um, then um, it, it, the production is less important. So I would say... Uh, the common agricultural policy also just played a big role uh, to, to make, uh, for example, uh, what we can see now in Brazil, uh, uh, we can also see that uh, agricultural productivity is growing there in, the, in this country very fast. And it's also due to uh, agricultural policies uh, from the Brazilian government that decided to really uh, emphasize that policy and, and to put money into the sector. So uh, I would say that that also it's just uh, not not to be forgotten forgotten uh, that uh, the common agricultural policy common agricultural policy actually fulfilled its role uh, as simple as that sometimes. Uh, Thank you very much. Those were some great answers from both of our speakers. Now I would like to remind the audience that you don't need to hesitate to put. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the YouTube chat and our speakers will get right to it. So now uh, we have already covered the history of the common agricultural policy, how uh, things are looking today. And now we can look a little deeper into the proposals of the Greens for reforming. The I, 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 think, I think, Clara, you had more on your presentation about how it's working today. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, so after um, that, um, um, after this brief uh, uh, in, uh, historical part, I, I wanted to um, talk to you a bit about how the CAP actually works today or how this common agricultural policy looks like. What is it? And um, so for that, I have also the rest of my presentation. And um, so the system we have now is this so-called two-pillar system um, that I introduced uh, before. So the first pillar uh, is dedicated to the direct payments to farmers. Uh, so the subsidies that farmers uh, receive from the European Union. And um, so uh, the direct payments are, as I said, uh, about, uh, represent about 70% of the CAP budget, so it's a very important part. And um, among these 70%, um, uh, we have uh, dedicated to direct payments. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, other categories. Um, so we have a basic payment per hectare. Uh, but um, we also have what I told you before, the green payment. So you can see it's about 30% of these 70%. So it's, it's quite an important part. We also have uh, um, a payment for young farmers, but you can see as it's only 2%, it's very low. Um, and it's not that important. Um, so these first three ones are actually mandatory for member states. So member states uh, need uh, or they have the obligation to use the EU budget 
um, and to give subsidies for these three uh, elements, so the basic payment per hectare, the green payment, and the payments for your funds. Afterwards, we, you also have um, other components, such as the, uh, the payment for uh, small farmers or uh, for areas with natural constraints, um, but they are not mandatory. So member states can choose uh, not to spend any part of the budget on that, um, on these particular issues. Um, and it's, it's very different from member state to member state. For example, France uh, decided uh, to keep uh, a lot of coupled payments. So we still have some payments that are linked to production, uh, especially in the livestock. Uh, uh, sector, which it actually makes more sense than per hectare, since you can have a lot of animals on, on a very small uh, surface. And um, yes, so France uh, really kept uh, those couple payments for the livestock sector, especially the beef sector. Um, but other member states decided to do otherwise and to uh, emphasize in payments for areas with natural constraints, for example, Austria, uh, which has more intense, so of course for them it makes more sense. Um, so you can see that uh, these direct payments are, are very important and actually they are now, they represent approximately 30% of a farmer's revenue uh, around Europe. So a farmer's revenue is composed of 60% of the money he gets for his production, but also of 30% of direct payments. So uh, you see that it's very that these direct payments are actually very important for the farmers, and um, uh, yes, the EU tried to emphasize the environmental role of a common actual of a common agricultural policy uh, with the green payment that I will go uh, into now. Uh, um, just to, to give you a bit of an idea of what is actually that green payment. So, as I said, it's, it's an additional support uh, to re reward uh, farmers that, have, uh, that are providing environmental public goods uh, because uh, you consider uh, that these public goods or the environmental public goods are not uh, paid by the market. Um, so uh, they decided to give uh, direct subsidies for that. And um, so the green payment is mandatory for the member states. So they have to implement it, but uh, the farmers uh, have actually flexible application of uh, the green payment. So they have many different options and they can choose uh, among some options. Um, so we would say that um, the green payment is an improvement from an environmental perspective, um, but it's it's very uh, it's not as important as it probably should be. Uh, so the three uh, measures that the farmers have to fulfill to get the green payment are uh, first of all the crop diversification, so it's to avoid uh, monocropping, which is a huge issue uh, from an environmental perspective. Uh, then the second one is the maintaining of permanent grassland, uh, which is also important to have uh, a diversification and also uh, uh, in um, have uh, also rotations among the crops. And the third one is the, what we call the ecological focus area, um, which includes uh, different, uh, uh, different um, uh, parts of uh, a farm. Um, for example, uh, it, what is called uh, an ecological focus area could be a hedge, or trees, or uh, biotopes, um, etc. So it's all of this. Um, so farmers need to maintain at least five percent of an ecological focus area. So it could be a tree or, or something like that. So you see that um, we have these three measures, but they are not very constraining for farmers. Um, and of course, we also have what we call a greening equivalency, 
meaning that farmers, for example, who uh, farm organically, who are producing uh, organic food, are uh, exempted of uh, of these uh, free measures, or more or less, they also uh, they, they are included uh, in the direct payment. Uh, of course, otherwise it would be uh, it would be unfair uh, to sort of punish them um, from the green payment just uh, because they don't fulfill the measures. Um, so that is for the green payment. Um, we can go now over to the other part of pillar one, because I, as I said, pillar one is the direct payments for the farmers, but also concerns the, concerns the common market organization. Um, I will not go too much into detail uh, on that point. Uh, just, um, just for you to understand that the common market organization is actually a framework of the European Union for market measures. Uh, to ensure that we have uh, a common market uh, since uh, we, we are uh, under a common market in the European Union. And um, so all agricultural products uh, are regulated by the common market organization. And we have now as what we call a single CMO regulation, so one regulation for all agricultural products. Um, so it's mainly market measures, um, for, for different products, so you have uh, you know, wine, cereals, etc. And uh, all have uh, then different uh, um, measures, but they are all uh, related to one uh, single regulation. Uh, and then the last um, part of um, how the, the, the common agricultural policy works now is, of course, with the pillar two. Uh, concerning the rural development. So that has been put in place to support rural areas and to foster environmental, social and economic development in rural areas. Um, so uh, actually uh, the European Union defined three priorities for the rural development program, uh, which is uh, agricultural competitiveness, uh, sustainable management of natural resources and also a balanced territorial development. And um, uh, member states can choose uh, under what we call a menu of measures. Uh, so you have a, in the legislation you have a list of measures that can be put in place. So the member states will choose among these measures and then formulate their own individual rural development programs. Um, and the rural development programs could uh, be uh, chosen by a member state to, for example, to give, um, to incentivize farmers to move from conventional to organic farming, uh, or to incentivize farmers to um, promote knowledge transfer, etc. So member states here have uh, a much greater flexibility and they can also really choose uh, uh, to what they want to dedicate the budget. Um, so, uh, yes, the pillar two is often used to, for, uh, to develop organic farming, but also, for example, uh, to help uh, uh, mountainous uh, regions, which could have uh, specific dif uh, difficulties, but also uh, a development of the network in rural areas, uh, etc. Um, so that was a bit of a part about how the, the common agricultural policy works now. So to conclude uh, a bit, I would like to go back to our, our, our main objectives of the common agricultural policy and to ask a bit, okay, um, knowing how the CAP has evolved and what it is now, um, does the CAP actually fulfill its objectives and um, what are the main issues and how should the CAP look like in the future? So one, one thing that we can say is that the CAP has definitely succeeded in increasing agricultural productivity, as we saw. Actually, it has succeeded a bit too well because we are still uh, overproducing. And um, the common agricultural policy is still increasing productivity by having those direct payments per hectare. 
if you're a farmer and you want to get you want to get more money and also more subsidies one very easy option is to grow so to have more land and to produce more so uh, what we can see is that we actually increase agricultural productivity but uh, probably a bit too much and um, one of the challenge now of the common agricultural policy is to uh, to tackle that, that productivity issue uh, the other the second objective uh, to ensure a fair standard of living for uh, for farmers uh, i would say that that has not really been achieved because we have farmers that actually earn a lot of money uh, and uh, get what we call good money for 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 farming usually it's the big farms um, uh, or the big livestock productions but we also have a lot of farmers who have really uh, who are facing a lot of uh, um, uh, difficulties who have huge debt uh, who um, are really dependent on the subsidies etc so uh, fair standard of living is, is also a question mark of, of, of the cap today, is how, how to ensure that with the system that we have now. Uh, the third point, stabilize the market. Yes, that's also still an issue. Price volatility concerning agricultural products is very high and is a huge issue for farmers, um, especially in the cereal market, for example. Uh, prices can really change a lot. Um, and the common agricultural policy really has huge difficulties to, to, to provide an answer to that or to, to, to help stabilize the market. Um, on the point four and five, yes, the common agricultural policy has ensured food security and food is actually available for us EU citizens at a very reasonable price. Uh, usually, uh, Europeans don't spend more of 16% of their income uh, on food, which is quite low. Um, but that can also be a, a question mark. Uh, is it actually uh, um, a, a good thing to, to subsidize our agriculture in order for, for citizens to have food at, uh, at, at, at a cheap uh, or at an affordable price? Um, surely we have ensured food security uh, but also maybe a bit too well, so that's also a question mark. But uh, I, I will leave um, the floor now for questions and also after for, to Antoine, who will talk to us about um, the... Um, um, sorry? Who <laughs> will talk to us about um, what could be uh, the demand uh, from the FIEG on, on agricultural policy and also how uh, the next reform will look like. Okay, so we haven't had uh, any more questions from the audience so far. I encourage everybody who would like to ask our speakers something to write it down in the YouTube chat section. Uh, as for now, I would like to give the word to Antoine to continue about the green demands. Okay, um, <clears throat> thanks very much. Uh, so I don't have a PowerPoint presentation or anything. And uh, and, and so my, um, really, as soon as you have question, I think that in the second part, it should really be like, don't hesitate to, for, for those who are in the conversation, don't hesitate to interrupt me. And for Martin, if you see that there is a question in the YouTube chat, same, don't hesitate to interrupt me in the in the in the middle of my presentation. Um, so first, first what, what so Clara has, has described the, the situation right now and the, 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 the situation we are in. And uh, and basically when we see what how the first common agricultural policy was built, it was here to solve a crisis and with five objectives. And, and as, as, as Clara said, it somehow fulfilled most of its objectives. But today we are facing a different crisis with different elements. And so there is a need uh, to redefine these, uh, these, uh, the, our objectives and to, uh, based on, 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 on the objectives, try to find the, the, the most appropriated policy. Because what, what are the problems right now? Um, 
we said it a bit like there are too low prices uh for 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 goods because now we have we we don't have any guaranteed prices so we are based on the on the on the world market uh, prices and and these are too low and that it does not allow farmers at least many farmers to live decently from their production also what is the second problem we have an industrial agriculture that keeps using too many chemicals inputs and pesticides and it's threatening both our health our soils and our climate and this is a this is a, a big problem that we have that we have to face also we see that many europeans don't have access to affordable and quality food like the hunger there, there is not much hunger as there, there was in the past but we see that there is uh, like the, the the problem has evolved to the fact that many people uh, are feeding themselves with low quality food um and they 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 like uh, that that will then leads to uh, to uh, diseases like like chronic diseases with a heart problem or or diabetes or uh, or also more ser even more serious uh, even more serious uh, diseases such as cancer because of the of the pesticides and the chemicals that are in the that are in the food um, and uh, we also see that animals are suffering in industrial breeding, and this is a this is a problem. And um, and we see that biodiversity is eroding, uh, that water is polluted, that the soil is is depleting. And so these are the problems that we are facing. And for that, we need new objectives for new policies. Um, oh yeah, and also we see that the the fact that. Uh, we we subsidize our 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 products our production a lot um, means that uh, our exports they participate to the destruction of farming structures in many southern uh, countries so if we take this picture it's it's look a bit a bit dark but actually there, there's some kind of a of a light uh, that that shines somewhere and it's that the alternatives they exist and they are working and there are many farmers that are already working with more agroecological practices um, that are uh, that wants to change practices um, like a, a whole new generation of farmers was uh, uh, that, that want to, to 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 change that there are also consumers that are evolving um, many of them are want to have more organic food uh, many of them are are going back to short supply uh, chains and these alternatives they show us that we have a possibility to change the european agricultural model and, uh, and and but now we need the policy that will make it from a niche that is currently is to an actual uh, uh, an actual policy uh, like to 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 something that will apply to 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 everyone um, and basically the the common agricultural policy today is is doing the the opposite of what what it should do it's uh it's demands it's it's um yeah it's uh there have been this fall of prices that that i've mentioned since the the regulation tools have been dismantled and um, we also have to see that public aids is uh is unequally distributed it's 80 percent that is going to uh, of the public support is going to the 20 yes the 20 percent biggest farms in the eu um and uh and basically the regulation and the greening that uh clara mentioned they did not succeed in reducing the use of chemical fertilizer uh, nor pesticides so basically this is the this is the situation in in, in which we we are right now and the the question is uh, is so what is the the agriculture we want? And I say that basically we can sum it up in three main objectives. Uh, our first objectives it should be to uh, to allow uh, farmers to leave uh, to earn a decent income from their production. That is not the case right now. Uh, I'd say that our second biggest objective should be to make sure that. Uh, that all Europeans have access to uh, a good, uh, a quality, and healthy, and a nutritious food. And the third objective should be that our agricultural system, instead of contributing to climate change and to biodiversity erosion and to soil depletion, should, in the opposite, contribute to uh, enrich enriching the soil, uh, fostering biodiversity, and, and contributing to climate mitigation and carbon storage. Um, 
And uh, oh, I'm sorry if some people can hear my cat. Uh, uh, it's my I, I, my my cat is uh, in eat, so she's uh, she's doing a lot of noise behind me. Um, so so yeah, and and this we we can do that. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, yeah. Th these are the our our three our three our three elements, and then there are, there are things that 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 are coming with this. Uh, for example. Uh, when we said that farmers should earn an, a proper income from from their production, we also should say that we want many farmers, that we want uh, living countryside. We don't want like an agriculture in which it's only big corporations that are producing food. It's not compatible. It's it's a question of a of a model. Um, we uh, we want like uh, animal rights to be respected uh, in the in the in in the in the farming system. Uh, there is we, we need a reduction of consumption of uh, of animal products also to to be compatible with uh, uh, with uh, with climate change because meat production is contributing to, to climate change a lot. Uh, we need a fair access to land in order to do that, uh, so that farmers can can actually uh, um, access access to land um, and. Um, yeah, basically, an, an agricultural system that does not try to export its production at all cost and uh, defends the principles of food sovereignty worldwide. And the question is, how do we do that? Basically, what I'm going to say now, it's a bit hypothetical because there is, I think, one big barrier that prevents us, at least from the first part of what I'm saying, that prevents us in, 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 in doing what, what you are talking about. It's WTO. And the fact that most of the, the rules that, 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 we, that would be put in place in an ideal world, they are, uh, they are forbidden by the World Trade Organization. But there are also some good things about World Trade Organization uh, in, in agriculture, but in, in general, that's, that was, a, that was a, a big fight of the green in the 90s to, to try to keep agriculture out of WTO, but they didn't manage. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we should somehow re reintroduce uh, some market regulation and production regulation tools to uh, to avoid overproduction and to guarantee some some price. We should also end trade agreements uh, or l like the, the the free trade agreements that we have now, and instead try to have fair uh, like. Trade agreements that would promote uh, fair trade, local food production, and higher social and environmental standards um, in countries we are trading with, in order to try to make a that because our current free trade trade policy is like a race to the bottom, and we should try to make a, a race to the to 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 the higher standards. Um, and yeah, we should also work on, on on European food autonomy, and there is like protein uh, autonomy. Um, Tuk, tuk, tuk. Uh, and then the question is, if we have fair income for farmers, which should be our, our our goal, then it means also that maybe our our like the money that we are using for for cap should be focused on the transition and on some useful things. So, for example, we should focus the money on supporting the installation of young farmers or new farmers, and introducing land management tools that guarantee a fair access to land. Uh, we should also work on the on on training uh, young farmers to uh, agroecological practices. Um, we should focus the, fo the the support on 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 small and virtuous farms, and we should not support uh, agro industry as we currently do. Um, we should basically not use public support to maintain artificial artificially low prices but instead we should support the transition towards agroecology uh, towards organic agriculture towards uh, holistic management and permaculture uh, and we should not give payments uh, if if people are not re like respecting the highest possible criteria is them of human social environmental and animal welfare uh, standards um and um yeah we can also support that for example by uh putting minimum shares of local and organic products in public catering in schools or in administration in order to uh, to and to ensure that there are markets uh, for local and organic uh, uh farmers um 
then uh, for for um, to have an agricultural system that respects our health and environment, we uh, sorry for the cats behind me. Um, we should we should like favor climate friendly agricultural technique. We should uh, uh, we should support uh, agriculture according to uh, health recommendation. So, for example, there are many health recommendations that say that we should eat, eat less meat. So, and and we should have more veg vegetable pro uh, vegetable proteins in in our in our own. Uh, in our own meal, so maybe we should subsidize uh, agriculture accordingly. Um, there is like the question of GMO, the question of seeds, but it's a bit beyond uh, the question of uh, of uh, of uh, of the reform of the common agriculture policy. So I think I think this is um, yeah, th this is basically the in the direction in which, as young greens, we would like to see our agriculture uh, going. Uh, but now, except if you have questions, I don't know if there are questions that have come up. No, Martin? Um, yeah, I would maybe like to ask, okay. in your opinion, uh, what do you think the EU can reasonably do to prevent uh, imports of cheaper goods? For example, if we want to subsidize the meat industry less uh, and ban factory farming, what can we do to uh, make sure that factory farmed meat doesn't come from outside the EU here with cheaper prices? And do you think that will pass along with the... Uh, different trade yeah. agreements between the EU and different countries. When, won't it have to be renegotiated? Yeah, actually, we are not we are not importing a lot of meat. Uh, currently, we, we are exporting cheap meat because our meat production is heavily subsidized. Uh, and uh, and so because, of course, it costs it, it, it costs more money. It, it might be it might sound crazy, but it costs more money to raise a cow in uh in a country in in africa than to do it in europe because in europe you're subsidized heavily subsidized to do it and uh and you have like the infrastructures that are um that are better that are more efficient so uh yeah uh, i i i'm sorry i think i missed your question the point of your question yeah so basically hopefully the heavy subsidies in the eu mm -hmm. will stop Mm -hmm. And making meat will yeah. be much cheaper. Yeah. Uh, sorry, will be much more expensive. Yeah. So, from outside of the EU, it'll be cheaper than inside the EU. So, how mm -hmm. do we stop? How do we stop these and not break trade agreements and so on? Yeah, I think that the the the, the first thing is about the, our trade agreements because the the actually the import of meat is 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 really strongly regulated and we still have like uh, quotas with most of the countries and uh, and for example when we are signing uh, the trade agreement with Canada there is a big part of it that is about increasing meat, meat imports to 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 Europe and uh, and so this is by changing I, th I think most of it goes by changing trade agreements and uh, and if needed trying to put uh, like like to put like uh, quantitative measures that would that would uh, that would uh, that would uh, like restrain imports uh, and and also we could also go with something with prices so putting a bit more custom on meat imports for example clara do you want to add something to it or no okay thank uh, you that was very informative other questions from anyone here Sorry, I hope I didn't lose you. Don't um, hesitate to speak up, guys. And girls and others. Uh, yeah, Gina? Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, yeah, you were talking a lot about um, to focus on small farmers and um, yeah, support them. And we've seen in the presentation from Clara that um, it's not compulsory the payments for small farmers are not comp compulsory um, 
And yeah, my question would be: Would this be uh, could this be a possible solution to make it, for example, a compulsory um, to give payments to the small farmers to support them? And finally, yeah, have a more sustainable food system. Yeah, yeah. Um, may maybe this is something that they uh, can you can you mute again, Gina? Sorry. Uh, One second. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is something that I should have mentioned. Of course, I said that now, like the vision that I presented, it's it's something that we want for the long term. Like if we had like a majority of greens. Uh, of young greens, because I, uh, there might be some disagreement with the older greens, who knows. Uh, but the majority of young greens uh, in, in power, we, we would, this is what we would, we would defend. But, uh, but right now, if we end any kind of direct support to farmers, what we'll see is that uh, farm, lots of farmers will lose a big share of their income. And this might even more favor big agriculture. So, so far, the Greens are not defending the end of, um, of direct payments to, uh, to, to farmers. We are more trying to go through a transition that would, uh, that would uh, enable like focusing a bit more money on helping farmers to transition, for example, to organic agriculture, because we see that farmers are earning better income when they're in organic agriculture than they're in that when they're in conventional agriculture. Um, but to uh, answer your question, yes, this is a big thing uh, of the of the of the greens and what we are fighting for in, in the parliament currently. Um, there are actually two things that we that we want to do, and the first one is about capping, uh, so putting a maximum amount uh, that that uh, that farm that farmers can get in money, and using the money that we get from this capping, using it to redistribute it to the first hectares for farmers, uh, and using also a part of this money for helping the transition. So yeah. We are submitting amendments to make this payment, uh, to make this uh, redistributive payments mandatory, and to introduce uh, a capping to the to the payments. Okay. Great. Thank you for your answer. Does anybody have any more questions? Okay, Clara, you can go on. <laughs> um. <clears throat> So it's maybe more a, a, a general comment or something I'm, I'm always wondering is, uh, okay, we, we, we discussed about all the, the, the problems of a common agricultural policy today. And one of, uh, of, of my question is, can we actually uh, improve agriculture while staying into that common, while staying with that common agricultural policy? and trying to change uh, bits here and there of these direct payments, et cetera. Or do we, is that actually possible or do, do we need to, to change the system and to really rethink that? It's probably not possible on the, the current uh, European policies, but it's a bit a question I'm, I'm wondering myself uh, and I'm, I'm speaking here out loud is, um, Yes. How how far can we can we change that system to, to answer all the problems of agriculture today? Uh, yes. What do you think? Um, I'd say. I mean, my my position would be that indeed we need a more radical system and and uh, a more radical change. And when I say that, for example, we should get rid or or disobey to WTO rules on agriculture, this is like something super actually super radical. And and but but still in the current framework, we can actually achieve some changes. Uh, we can make sure that uh, if we focus a bit more uh, payment like uh, uh, supports uh, subsidies to helping transit farmers who decide to transition to organic agriculture for example or or all the good practices that that exist we this is this is something that uh, that that can already help changing the thing and actually i think that's one way that the greens are mostly are, are often gaining uh, something is like 20 years ago people were or, or even 30 years ago uh, people were saying okay uh, your organic agriculture it, it, it's 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 just a niche it will never it will never be able to 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 feed the to feel the world but okay we'll make you happy we'll focus like a bit of money to help uh, farmers to transition to to uh, organic agriculture 
And then you see that farmers, like a few farmers, are, are transitioning to our organic agriculture. And then you see that they are earning a better income. You see that they are producing uh like similarly to 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 what uh conventional agriculture is is producing uh so that it doesn't put our our it, it doesn't put us into a risk of food insecurity uh so actually by i think that even what what we change here it's also a way to prove that our solutions they are viable so maybe this is so, so this is why and and also everything that we win now like the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, they are there are crises that crises that are happening right now and that we should try to tackle right now. And every step that we manage to achieve now, it it still has results. So of course we would prefer a, probably a more radical change, but uh, it still it doesn't mean that we should not try to improve the current situation. And maybe and we can still achieve something in the current model, I'd say. But so maybe, except if there are more questions, I can go explain the the what the, the the current proposal, what 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 has been proposed by the by the European Commission, and uh, and uh, and 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 basically we'll see. And I guess you can already have a bit of an idea if it goes in our direction or not. Um, basically, the, the the European Commission. Uh, had uh, two objectives when they were working on the on the on their reform. They said that they want to simplify and that they want to modernize the common agricultural policy. But the question is, uh, what is moderni modernization? I'm not I'm not so sure what it means. Uh, and 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 what is simplification? But especially what is like. For who is it going to be simpler? Is it going to be simpler for farmers? Is it going to be simpler for the state? Is it going to be simpler for the payment agency? Or is it going to be simpler for the commission? It's it's kind of hard to 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 say. But what the, the direction that they've that they've gone to when they submitted this wonderful proposition that is quite heavy, as you can see. Um, and it's it's printed recto verso with two pages on uh, on each uh, sheet. Um, is trying to uh, to we 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 can say renationalize a bit cap. They want to give more more freedom to member states to decide how they want to spend the money of the common agricultural policy. The way it's going to work is that each member state they will have to uh, draw what they call a strategic plan, and in this strategic plan they will be able to tell the Commission, okay, uh, so I want to spend uh, this amount of money on on, on direct payments. I want to spend this amount of on of money on uh, supporting uh, like with uh, the 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 the. the dairy farmers and with this money i want to support this and this and basically there are some guidelines in the in the in the text in the proposed regulation but according to us these guidelines are a bit too weak um for example uh there, there was like one of the of the things that clara briefly mentioned was uh the ecological focus area this was something that was really strictly defined in the previous legislation. And now in the current text, so the, uh, the ecological focus area, it's basically trying to reserve on the field, on each field, um, a part of the, of the field that would be uh, saved for non-productive, uh, product, like uh, non-productive plants. So you would leave it with flowers, with uh, some some herbs and everything, and the idea is to try to have uh, uh, to have more diversity in this area. Also, now they should be pesticide free. This this ecological focus area, and so there were like strong criteria on what it is, and this was one of the condition to be able to access uh, payments, and um, and now in the new plan, it's only one line defining it. So it means that member states will be able to define anything they want as an ecological focus area. And of course, there is a risk because it's not only with this, it's with many, many stuff that member states will go for the 
the the smallest uh, the the less um, uh, how to frame it the less um, the with the solution that will hurt their competitiveness the least because and so so for example if there is a measure that farmers oppose because they say oh no actually you know spending part of my field for a non-productive uh, thing that uh, i'm losing some money with it uh, so please try to not do it maybe or or to do it only with allowing us for example to uh, to do a different kind of plant on it or or this kind of stuff uh, then the member state might say that and it might be accepted and the second member state show like seeing that the first member state is doing that might say okay i cannot impose like stricter condition to my own farmers so i will go even lower and lower and lower so there is a risk that this will create some kind of a race to the bottom uh then a second thing um but but then in in this strategic plan the basic architecture of the of, of what Clara described is still the same um with the direct payments with the decouple support so linked to uh to how many lands you own and the couple support which is linked to how much you produce uh and uh and the redistributive payment and the you support to young farmers and all these things that are not in the eco scheme all these things are not changing so much but they like each each state is able to define it as they as they want and there's a second very problematic thing in this uh, in this reform it's linked to the budget uh the as you probably know the European Union, they want to do more things, but trying not to increase the budget. So in the general budget, uh, the share that will go to the common agricultural policy is reducing. Uh, and when you look, and it's reducing more than only because you, you can say, oh, there is Brexit. So it's it makes sense that it's reducing. No, it's reducing more than Brexit. Uh, and uh, and and especially the part that is reducing is the part on rural development. And as Clara explained explained it, rural development it's basically all the good things. Like you have like the direct payments, they are they are causing like uh, like they are supporting big farms and they are supporting. Uh, uh, like uh, more industrialization of the agriculture, but the rural development and there are, it's all the things that are trying to compensate the bad thing about the first pillar, and they are cutting a lot of of money in this in, in this uh, in this rural development. So I'd, I'd say that these are the two main problems uh, that we have in this uh, in in this legislation. So now what we will try to do. Uh, as a, um, as a, as the, the Greens in the European Parliament is is uh, is to try to uh, basically define stricter criteria at the European level uh, to make sure that we do not leave too much margin uh, to member states uh, for many different things. Um, it will be uh, about making sure that, for example. Um, because yeah, I, I should have said that now the, the commission is saying that they are changing, uh, their delivery model and they are switching to a result based approach. That's basically, they will see in the end, okay, have the member state, uh, achieve what they committed to do. And, uh, and if this is the case, we will uh, grant them with the bonus, and if they don't, we will give them a penalty. And uh, but when you look at what they consider as results, it's not re really results. For example, if I'm giving an example, it is not actually in the text, but that that can be a, a, a that can help you understand how it works. For example, you have the the uh, an objective which is to reduce water pollution. So you, you, you can have like two main sources of water pollution that are linked to agriculture, like nitrates pollution, which is linked to, uh, to uh, livestock farming, 
and you have uh, pesticides pollution, like uh, that 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 are pesticides that are flowing in the rivers, and and that pollutes the river. But the, the the indicator that they use to measure that is not actually what is the quality of the water. Uh, it's the, the 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 criteria that they will use. The indicator that they will use is how many farms committed to improve their practices. So it's not really a result-based approach. It's it's uh, a result-based would be like to actually measure the quality of the water and say, okay, you've done better. Uh, congratulations. Because if we have some farms that are like, even if there is a big number of farms that are doing good practices, if you still have aside many farms that are doing the worst, the water is going to be in a worse situation than it was before. So. On this also, we will try to, to change it a bit to make it maybe a really, a real result-based policy. Uh, and yeah, I don't know if it was really clear what I said, because also I'm, I'm, I'm in this the whole day. So maybe, uh, uh, yeah. No, it, it did sound clear. Thank you very much for this answer, Antoine. So in case anyone else has any more questions, you can write them down. Uh, in the sidebar chat of the YouTube video, or if you are in the conversation, you can speak up, such as Clara. Go ahead, Clara, ask a question. Uh, no, actually, I didn't have a question, but there is a question from... Um, Luke? Luke? Think it's Luke? Do you, you want to say it out loud, Luke? Luke? I don't know. Hello. Um, for us, it's totally clear that, uh, for the left parties, that um, the CAP has to reform, but how is it with right uh, political parties? Um, are they thinking the same about it or, or not? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, so basically there, it, it depends. You, you have a different kind of, uh, of uh, it, it's hard to put the whole right in the same package. While the Greens are quite united on their position, uh, then you can have very different position. You can have like some agricultural people that say, okay, we, we need to keep subsidizing farmers and we need to leave them uh, in the, in the we, we need to like uh, be, bring more competitiveness. So we need to have to keep, let's say, industrializing our agriculture. And you have some that will say, okay, we should also get rid of all this uh, crazy conditions that the greens have put to say okay you need to respect this and that and that to be able to access payment which is the greening that uh, that clara was mentioning that you have some some criteria that you need to respect so they if they were if they had free ends they would get rid of all this uh but of course they are not saying saying it at lot but that's basically the, the the way they would go but that that's more for the Christian Democrats, for the EPP. They, they are more in this in this way. But then you have the centrist, the liberals. Then they are more into we should stop uh, spending money on that, and we should let free market uh, deal with everything. And uh, and 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 yeah, and they, they want to cut, 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 cut. And you're you're like when you're attending some meeting with, with them. It's like uh, uh, th there was like some uh, li liberal MEP that was there, and I think in this in one minute speech he used ten times the word "cut" uh, to cut the budget, cut the spend, cut, 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 uh, because they think that we should not spend money on that. Uh, so yeah, we have these two different positions, let's say, and then it goes in different degrees because of course some yeah, based on the nationality, based on if you're. A farmer or if you're a consumer or this kind of thing great did that an answer your question luke uh yes thank you hey thank you for the question and thank you for the answer now uh clara gets to speak sorry for the interruption uh thanks but i, I actually i didn't have a question so uh um yes <laughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, so in that case, Eloise, and we should slowly be wrapping up this webinar. Uh, yes, I have a question because uh, I suppose that uh, um, as uh, the project of reform is uh, actually debated um, in the commission, uh, there are a lot of lobbies. 
and I wanted to know uh, how heavy uh, the lobbies are. And um, yes, I, I try to speak up. <laughs> I don't know if they are li uh, hearing or okay. So yes, about the the uh, how heavy are the lobbies. Should, should we should, should is it a question for the lobbyist because clara is a, is technically a lobbyist uh she has a lobby badge of the european parliament and uh, and why or, 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 or me um <clears throat> basically it's it's it really depends and um of course lobby lo i think first i'm gonna make a general statement on 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 lobbies uh not all lobbyists are and not lobbying is not always bad like for example earlier today we were meeting with people from ngos and we were discussing on some some key issues on which they have a a, a special uh a special uh, uh expertise on and and this is very precious for for us to have access to this expertise and uh <clears throat> but of course you can guess that the right wing they are getting their expertise more to uh industry lobbyists and to industrial farmers uh etc so <clears throat> as a green i'm not we are not so much lobbied by the industry uh but uh yeah maybe in a in a later because I could also tell you some stories about lobbying that that happened uh, recently, but uh, I think that that is not so much cap related. But yes, they are here; they are following the process. But uh, but yeah, then I, I think that in the end, uh, a green will vote green, and a uh, conservative will vote conservatively. And 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 maybe the, the lobbyists are mostly bringing their their expertise. I would say. Um, yes, if I can add something, um, I mean, since I'm a lobbyist, but not because of that. Uh, I think one of the issues is that, as Antoine said, um, lobbyists are here to, to give their expertise. And, um, and that, that is an issue because sometimes, uh, I mean, it doesn't uh, go for everyone, but sometimes uh, you have uh, people in the commission or in the parliament or in the council that don't have the necessary knowledge to uh, to judge the legislation or to propose amendments or so they are quite keen on on having input and uh, one of the one of the possibilities to have input is uh, coming from from lobbyists um, so I would say that they, they are they are necessary in that sense and um, and as Antoine said, you, you have you can have uh, what we call good lobbying, uh, but also depends on where, where you stand. And and bad lobbying coming coming from industries that of course advocate for let's say if you are if you are pesticide industry for for, for more pesticides. So um, but it all all depends on uh, which lobby you want to hear uh, and to focus on. Great, that was a great answer. Thank you. Okay, does anybody have more questions or do you have anything more to add, Antoine? Since yeah, you have very good uh, power dynamic of lobbyist versus person who works at the EU. Yeah, no, uh, I, I, I don't know. There, there are... I, yeah, if you have if you have more question in the meantime, I can think about uh, some things to to say if you want. But uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is the last call for questions. And since I'm not seeing any questions in the YouTube chat, and. Uh, yeah, probably, probably no questions from the conversations participants. I would like to quickly inform you that uh, next webinar will be about our next webinar from like the Food Systems and Animal Rights Working Group, 
will be about animal rights. It will take place sometime next month and we will keep you informed both on the FYEG main web, main Facebook page and also on our working group's Facebook page. To sum up what we've covered today, uh, we have discussed the history of the common agricultural policy of the European Union, how things are paid out today. We've talked about the Greens' positions on the CAP and also the reform possibilities. Uh, we've had some very interesting questions about the speed at which we can reform the CAP, uh, how we can protect our markets from cheaper imports uh, once our productions will be affected by new subsidy laws. We had questions about lobbying, about position of the right-wing parties in the European Parliament, and concerns about productivity. Uh, this webinar's recording will stay on YouTube, of course, for anyone to watch it later. And I would like to give. Uh, yeah. What would you like to say? Yeah, it's 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 mostly yeah. I was trying to to try to give you a, of an example like uh, uh, of other things that that we try to work on aside from the things that i mentioned there are many things that we try to work on at the same time so it's hard to keep everything in mind but for example uh, last week uh, I, I was uh, you know, watching a, a reportage that was made by french television and they, they were french public television they were saying the list of the biggest recipients of uh, cap subsidies and among them uh in france uh you had uh in, in the top 10 i think you had at least five uh brands of wine uh and three of them were champagne's brand and you're like how is it like champ it, is it really fair that we are giving money to champagne but the crazier thing is why are they getting money is because and actually so i've after watching this i've i've dived into the legislation and i've i've checked okay how are they getting that it's a, and there is a special tool uh, and uh, that, that is called a sector intervention for wine and one of the measures that is in there is that uh, the you can get subsidized for promotion in the international of your products so for example if you're making an advertisement uh, uh, campaign in China to export champagne, then you can get uh, subsidized by uh, the common agricultural policy. And so after that, we've decided to go through the whole sector intervention that exists and try to, to see how we can uh, limit or, or delete uh, these kind of promotions. Uh, because, for example, three of these champagne brands that were in the top 10 uh, were belonging to the same group, which is uh, um, a big international group. So we are actually subsidizing uh, super big companies directly so that they can do advertisement company uh, campaigns for champagne. And so hopefully this will end if, uh, if there is some, some kind of uh, good sense in the agricultural committee and in the parliament in general. Thank you for this last point. That's very interesting how the common agricultural policy can be so deeply unjust and benefit some huge corporations on, you know, to the detriment of small farmers. So if nobody has any more questions, this is the last call. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So I would like to thank very much uh, both of our speakers, both Clara Reb and uh, Antoine. So uh, I would like to invite all of our uh, listeners to like our Facebook page, Food and Animals, FYEG, and also, of course, to like uh, FYEG's Facebook page and follow our uh, events, progress, and things like that. And I would like to once again remind you to um, watch out for our next webinar on animal rights and other forms of animal rights activism. So uh keep an eye on us and we will see you next time thank you very much for joining us and goodbye